Praise you, Jesus and Mary. This is Romal Simeon, and the book is the Gospel of John, and we're in chapter 4, with, uh, it's called Love Letters from Your Father. Love letters mean that all of the scriptures are love letters of the Father to us, as St. Jerome, the writer of the Vulgate said, and Jesus is the love letter. And every word of the scriptures and all of the teachings of the Gospels are love letters that Jesus, the messenger, the true, complete love letter of the Father, is sending to each Christian, each follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, today, I'm going to say something uh, a little different from before, because all, all, until this point, I've been giving you my conversations, talking to, to you about the words of the Bible, about the incidents uh, of John the Baptist, of the uh, Cana, of the uh, gathering of the apostles, of going to uh, the temple, and then going to Samaria, and how Jesus made not only a disciple of the woman at the well. Now, we don't have her name in the Bible, but uh, I call her St. Jacoba, because she says that she's at the well that the father Jacob gave to the people of Samaria, of the Jews, of his children, and they inherited it. And so this is the well that they're talking about. So the, her name is not actually put into the scripture, but I call her St. Jacoba because she became the first missionary of Jesus Christ. The first one who received from him his teaching, who was converted by him. She was a sinner, not only a Samaritan, but a sinner who had five hu husbands and the actual person, she told him her true story. She didn't want to tell him the story. He always say good things of, about yourself, you know, when you tell your story to Jesus, when you speak to him. In Lecture Divina, when you open up to Jesus, he sees who you are, and you can't hide things from him. Because if you're going to have a conversation with him, it's not like conversations with other people. Other people, you always tell them the good things that you want to tell them. You tell them the incidents. You tell them things that would make them happy. You tell them things where you're agreeable. But you don't tell the things that are in your heart that are discouraging. The things which you did wrong. It's the same with myself. And I'm telling you incidents about my own life, my work as an evangelist, and my interest in writing the, uh, the lecture, the, my lecture divina and meditations of the books of the gospel, page by page, I tell you the good things. I, I am proud of the way it came through. In fact, some people will say, gee, it's wonderful, the reading of the book. But I say, gee, I don't even know how I did it. I'm surprised myself after 30 years of work, of research, and all that I've tried to do to put into the, the inspiration that I've had of the Gospels, I'm surprised myself when I see the words of the, uh, of the, of the written page. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Because, but I don't tell you the things that went wrong. If I tell you evangelizing, yes, I can show you letters, hundreds of letters of pe people that say I did so much in their life that I brought them to the Lord that they'll never forget it and all that. And I have to say, hey, don't, don't give me glory. It's 
the Holy Spirit. In fact, when I read it myself, I said, did I write that? No. It was inspired of the Lord. And it's shocking to me. I can't remember it. I've got to read it myself to find out what is there. It says like a new book. But what I don't tell you, I don't tell you the mistakes I made. Where I had opportunity to reach out to someone and they were interested or got interested, but something occurred where I had some kind of a schema or some kind of a bad attitude and I knocked them off. Those are the things I have to ask pardon for with the Lord. Those are the things that disturb my mind. That when I want to come before the Lord, I have to say, Lord, forgive me. I'm the publican. I'm the prodigal son. That I have to say, forgive me. I've sinned. And I know it. I don't show it, but I know it. And it disturbs me. And there were many, too. I was going to say how many, but even one is enough. But I can go through a list of them before the Lord when I go to confession, when I praise before him. But I don't tell other persons the way that I messed up. So let me say that when we tell our story to the Lord, he knows the true story. He knows the negatives. He knows, we say, the mistakes I made. But sometimes they're not just mistakes. Sometimes they were, at the moment, deliberate. Sometimes I knew I was doing wrong and did, went ahead and did it. Because I wanted to be defensive. I wanted to save myself. I didn't want the annoyance. I didn't want to blow out in anger and stifled it. So that's who we are. We are who we are in the sight of God. I remember that in my patron, St. Francis of Sisi. He says, it doesn't matter, he told the, the brothers. It doesn't matter if people think I'm crazy or if they throw me in the gutter and say that I am insane, I'm not proclaiming the gospel because I am who I am in the sight of God. If they think I'm a sinner, if they think I'm terrible, if they think I'm horrible, and many have this experience. You all, all have that experience, I'm sure. Where you were innocent. You were trying to do the, a good thing. And people misinterpreted you. People saw evil in you. He says, if they think I'm a saint and I'm evil, then I'm evil. I'm a black sheep. But if I'm, I do good and I'm trying and I'm doing my best and I'm really trying hard and I regret things that I do wrong and people can't see that and they say I'm a sinner, and I'm not. I am what I am in the sight of God. And that's the truth. That's the reality. That's what we have to face. And that's all marked, not only in the book of life that we have when we go before the Lord to get entrance into heaven, but in the book of death where we crossed out what should have been good. Okay, so now we're back to St. Jacoba, to the woman at the well. So she goes after the Lord shows her who she is, and, and her story is out because she has to admit before the Lord says, you must be Messiah. You, you see right into it. You tell me my life better than I can say it. You tell me the evil in my life. And yet, you reach out to me as a person who wants to return. A person who 
believed that I was better than the people who gave me NVIDIA, who looked down on me, who knew my secret sins. And so she rushes out to Sechem, to the people of her, her town. We don't know how many there are, hundreds, thousands, whatever they were. And she proclaims and says, I've met him, this man at the well. I think it's the Messiah. I believe it's the Messiah. He saw into me. And she tells them and witnesses. So it's not just what we receive from the Lord. It's not everybody wants to receive from the Lord. And he gives. Jesus gives. He says, I came to you. He told the apostles at the Last Supper. See, I came to you and bowed down to you and I washed your feet. And I came to you as a servant. But yet, I am the master. I am the master. I came to you as a servant. You're all asking who's going to be the boss? Who's going to be the honcho? Who's going to be the one who is all admired? Who's going to be the first among you? Don't think that. If you serve me, you will serve the servants of God. And by the way, that's the official title of the Pope. The greatest of Christians, the leader of the Christians, the successor of Peter. What is his true title? Servant of the servants of God. And that's how we have to see ourselves, because that's all we really are. It's Jesus who lifts us up. Jesus who shares his glory to us. Jesus who sets says, sit at my right hand, I'll put the enemies at your footstool. The image of Jesus. So, when we talk to the Lord, he's always giving, giving. But when persons talk wrongly to the Lord, the wrong prayer, as Jesus said when he gave us the Our Father, don't keep asking, asking God and getting mad at God because he doesn't give you what you want. Not what you need, not what belongs to you, not what he wants to give you, but what you want. Santa Claus prayer, as I call those. Santa Claus prayer. We don't get what we want. We stamp our feet and get annoyed. No, I'm not going to pray. I'm going to go to church because I didn't get what I wanted. It's childish. Not in a good sense. Not being a child but childish, like the word not being self, but selfish. So this woman then convinces the people, and they go back to the well. They go out to where this Messiah, where this, to them a stranger is sitting, and he's waiting for the 12 the apostles to come back from the village to bring food and he's good tell, tell teaching them a lesson he's going to show them how to serve the servants of God and so this is where we're at now and when I talk to you in these videos and these sections I I have to apologize in a way because I'm telling you my impressions. I'm telling you the good things I may have seen, have done, or how I'm enthusiastic over the Lord. I'm in love with him. Yes, I'm in love. <laughs> That's a fact. When you get in love with someone, you're going to talk about him. <laughs> you're going to proclaim him. You can't say, well, I don't know how to witness. <laughs> if you don't fall in love with Jesus, the most lovable, who is the God of love. God is love, and those who live together in love, in God live in love, and God lives in them. Well, that's it. You got to get excited. Say, hey, you're weird. You're some kind of a charismatic. You're a, a gospel singer or something like that. Well, can't help it. You can't help it. When you're in love with someone, 
they all see that you love some, that someone. When you fall in love, you can't hide it. The Holy Spirit does that to you. <laughs> yeah. The Holy Spirit is, is a power. He may be symbolized as a dove, but he's also symbolized as a fire on your forehead. <laughs> all right. So now I'm going to do something a little different. I'm not just going to tell you my impressions. I'm going to read what happened at Sikkim. When these people came back and Jesus uh, began to witness to them and how he, what he showed to in an in instant to each person that came to him. In an instant, because he was the son of God. He didn't need much time. Look into his eyes. And when you see, when he really sees and peers into you, and he peers into your heart. That says, the saints saw that. And he pierces their heart. He knew what they were doing right. He knew what they had done wrong. He was forgiving. Forgiving. Because he's a forgiving God. He's a merciful God. And they saw his mercy. And praised him for his mercy. And also an uplifting God. Who lifts us up holds us by the hand and sits us next to himself. So let me then hear, I hope I don't bore you. I hope I don't bore you. But it's not boring to me. It wasn't boring when I wrote it. It wasn't boring when Jesus told me this. So we are in John 4, chapter 4, and this is the chapter, the verse 36, the end of 36. The field comes to its harvesters. You don't go to the field, it comes to you. This is the bread we really came to eat this day, Jesus says to his disciples. I'm not hungry for physical bread. So make ready to lay your sickles and reap it for Yahweh God. Thresh it, free it from its chaff. Grind it into flour and leave it into holy loaves of proposition. Look at your Samaritans differently now. You are Jews. Look at the Samaritans with the eyes of God's spirit. They are your brothers. Yes, 12, Peter, John, James, Andrew. They are your brothers in creation. They were your brothers in sin. And now in repentance and grace. How long have they been awaiting God's Messiah and his word of mercy? So do not tremble at their approach for these people coming, the hundreds coming now from second to this well, are not a mob coming to scatter Jews from their midst. They come to embrace us. They come to embrace you. They come to seek your help. Their moving bodies resemble a field of grain bowing to the will of the Spirit who blows down their way. They are holding a scent and come to be gathered into the Father's barn. They're bowing down like wheat, pleading for you to gather them into the Father's barn. So my brethren, disciples, let us harvest this crop of souls and effect a great victory for the Lord of heaven. The Father of both Jew and Samaritan equally. Today we will prove that salvation is from the Jews and be proud. In his name we welcome 
our Samaritan unchosen brethren with open arms exult for what God is doing. My disciples, there is an ancient proverb that says, poor producing land is the field that requires the most attention. The unfertile, we come to fertilize. We just don't plow, we have fertilize it first. And then we plow it under. A good farmer takes greater pains to tend and bring a fuller potential to a lower producing vineyard or orchard. It may take many years to restore a sin's, a field's fertility. Yes, the people that are around you, the people they say have gone away from the Lord, people that you have tried to cultivate, that walk away and they don't go to church anymore, don't love Jesus and don't know Jesus, and didn't see Jesus in you, requires more work to make them fertile again. There may be little assurance that the same farmer who began the work will be there to enjoy the hope for harvest when it finally produces. And Jesus tells the apostles, don't just glory in these people coming to you and you helping them. There were others, maybe a previous generation of people who tried to help these people reach God. They will bless you. Today the proverb will be verified before your own eyes. Realize that none of you here did anything to prepare these people in this town, these Samaritans, you avoided them. You didn't want to see their shadow. You didn't want to give them a glass of water if they were crying in the desert. You didn't do anything to make them come to the Lord. In fact, you feared and despised them as being beneath yourselves and the culture you were taught. Yet it's to you who will have the honor to receive their repentance and convert them back to the Lord. Today, the Lord ordained you to be reapers of a fruitful field where others worked with little success before. Many teachers, such as Moses, the prophets, and some of their own sages worked hard. They did their praiseworthy words and examples, their prayers. They plowed and fertilized the hitherto unproductive soil of these men's hearts. How often did were holy seeds planted that seemed to die? So be very humble in the truth. Do not take too much glory for yourselves and gratefully remember the godly men who worked this field before. You reap the soil of others not now present. Where they lie, their spirits applaud you. Be aware these people are seeing the providential fulfillment of their own petitions. This is the day the Lord has made to fulfill both their prayers and mine. I am Messiah. I came to show others how to reap a harvest and to reap God's harvest. And to leave it, I'm going to leave it to you. When I leave you, it will be your field. The object lesson, my disciples, you are learning, 
is the purpose for which I sent you out into the world and came to Samaria. You are going to continue my mission, the one my father gave me, and not your own. Like this woman at the well. She saw her mission and went back and in one day brings people back to the well. She just doesn't hold it for herself. Just doesn't say thank you, Lord. But she comes to work with me. Now she is my disciple. We are collaborators. Not only must you sow the seed of God's word as you go, the ones you meet, don't see them as enemies. They are brothers. They are lepers, spiritual lepers. They are blind, spiritually blind. You have to remove your own blindness. You must reap the harvest awaiting your arrival whenever it comes. For years, their hearts were being readied by God, directed consciences and personal virtue. Trials, inspirations from the Spirit of God affected them to the coming of a greater day. We're all looking for the greater day. The same Spirit directed you to come and make it reality by coming to me. So remember that when you consummate, what you consummate here is through the power of God, but also with your own hand, with your own effort, with your own difficulty. But do not overcredit yourselves with its success. Do not overcredit your good works with its success. The fields of the spirit, your own hands must not bear, may not bear the calluses of those who ardently plowed and sowed the godly men who bore the noonday heat and suffered opposition before you. Suffer it yourself. Wipe your brows and put your hand to the plow. Today, my disciples, you learn the real lesson. The Lord has now reserved for you the joy of bringing in the sheaves. This place itself should help you to remember the Lord's day's lesson. The well Jacob dug here slaked the thirst of his children, their children's children, and generations of even strangers without discrimination. So also, you must pass on the refreshing word of the Lord without defining who should or who should not come to drink at his bounteous fountain of grace. Don't choose who drinks, who comes to look for water. So now arise from your meal. At this very moment, God is convincing those sinful and rejected people of Sechem to open their hearts and become his chosen. They're looking for me, and I need you. With enthusiasm, let us share in our Father's joy that our Samaritan brothers are about to return to their spiritual home, to us. Yes, Jesus came to bring us home, but he became he came to bring the lost sheep home. 
That's why he came into this world. To bring us home again. And that's where we will find rest. And we will all rejoice together. From now on, they will learn to worship. Not on one mountain or another. Not in one temple or another. But in spirit and truth. Disciples looked up and saw a throng of Samaritans stretching all along the three-quarter mile road from Sikkim to Jacob's well. There could have been a thousand. Just as Jesus finished his talk, his preparation pro prologue to his disciples to explain to them what would happen and how they must act. The townsmen leading the pack excitedly strode straight to where Messiah stood waiting at the well. It was not a well now. It was a gushing spring of water. Living water flowing. Drowned. Bringing them back like John the Baptist drowned people in baptism. Now, the spiritual spring was gushing out of that well. The sin is reminiscent of the shepherds of Bethlehem 30 years before, who on heeding the voice of God's angel, instantly put their worldly cares beyond to seek what God had sent and to men of goodwill. Both shepherds and Samaritans had the good sense and good hearts to discover Jesus for themselves without preconditioned attitudes. What attitudes? I need the water. I need you, Lord. We need each other. Jesus sat in the well war, beckon the people, instructing them with their proper spiritual values, repentance, and commitment. He did for them what he did for the Jews, what he did at Cana, what he did at the temple, what he did for Nicodemus. He revealed them to themselves. He healed all who came to him. The Samaritan's goodwill eliminated every prejudicial obstacle in their listening to the Christ. They let his words and spirit flow into their hearts and minds without resistance, without analysis. We an analyze preachers and teachers that come to us. You analyze me. <laughs> we, I analyze you. Put away those shadows. See with the light of Jesus. And what do we see? Ourselves naked before the Lord. Our spirits are open. Our hearts are open. And we want. And we don't see all that is good. And ask him. Not only give us a drink, Lord, but to wash ourselves. We wash our feet, wash our hearts, wash our minds. Until we're washed clean. And when we're as dirty or as filthy, as red with blood, wash us and make us white as snow. Let Jesus' words and spirit and grace flow into their hearts and our hearts without resistance. The insight God so freely gives to seekers after truth is suddenly effective. It's effusive and effective. Without any denial of personal misdeeds, we don't deny before the Lord. He knows us. We hear 
Jesus' words of love and mercy as coming from the Father himself. He is the Father. If you see me, you see the Father. In each listener, the gospel message sent from eye to heart to action and did not remain an empty word. If you hear the word of God and you say, well, I didn't see much in it. Something is wrong with the hearer, not with the seed. So lives are changed. Sometimes it takes a long time. It took me a long time. Sometimes instantly. Others with such an earnest beginning. Like the woman at the well, almost all confessed and vowed correction of life. They were reborn, replicating the woman. The entire town gave Jesus their wholehearted belief. And this entire episode, what about her? She's the one who helped to open the door. She was the one at the gate. She let Jesus in, them out from their captivity. Jesus, the woman's personal testimony was the key that unlocked the hearts of the people of Sikar. She proved to be their guiding angel. And that's what an evangelist is. Jesus is the messenger of the Father, and he is the message. With him, we become the angels of God, the guardian angels, the ones who open the door. Jesus' own apostle of love, it's on the vigor of her initial witness that so many others followed suit and converted. Her refusal to remain in denial, her responsible admission of personal guilt helped to convince her peers. Jesus had shocked her into abandoning her self-justifying defenses. And conf she confessed that she had what she had long hidden in her heart was an, and that was an indefensible evil. No one else had ever before succeeded in convincing the woman at the well before Jesus did. They shunned her. They criticized her. They didn't see that in seeking for sinful partners, she was seeking the love of God and didn't know it. Jesus showed it. Open hearts become changed hearts. Closed hearts remain inflexible. This is the day that Jesus opened the divisions between the cultures, human-driven cultures of Samaritans and the human attitudes of Jews who didn't reach out. The townspeople opened their hearts to Jesus' words with complete confidence and made it him their designated master, their teacher. Because he was the teacher. They saw him not giving him a designation. When people come, they say, oh, you're a teacher. No. If Jesus is the teacher. But Jesus already is a teacher. He's the great rabbi. And he patches his teaching on to lift us up to be teachers. And that's what he's doing to his apostles. People see when they begin to really open up and say, oh, I never saw that before. A new philosophy of life. Yes, he's the way, the truth, and the life. From now on, they would have no God but the one who is to love and worship 
and no law but his to obey. Sometimes people say, oh, you're law-abiding. I obey the laws that agree with the laws of God. I stop my car at the red light because the Lord says to me to keep people safe. I do not follow the law that says to kill babies because that's murder. That's not the law I follow. The thousands of laws in human cultures that are not laws. They're not laws. If they don't agree with the Ten Commandments, if they don't agree with the, the, the Gospels, if they don't agree with Jesus Christ, they're not laws. I have no regard for them. To betray, to be angry to kill to put people down as not being brothers to step on them and step and make myself go higher by stepping on others is not the law of God but to step up and to defend what is right to take the whippings that Jesus took on Good Friday. To say, yes, I love my brethren. I love my brethren, and there's some who in fr are in front of me and assist me. And there are some that we call brothers. I've got the wounds and the scars to prove it. Well, what about the wounds that I have dished out? We're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. So ever after, there become now people we call the Good Samaritans. Jesus is called the lover of Samaritans by his enemies as if that is a misnomer, that that is something to be ashamed of. But he's not ashamed to be called a lover of sinners. Not because they sin, but because they reveal it. They're not in denial. They're not saying the sin is not a sin, that a sin is a virtue. But they say, Lord Jesus, cleanse me cleanse me. With pleading love to the townspeople, they begged Jesus to tarry and be their revered rabbi to stay with them. And he did stay for two days with the apostles. But he had to go on. There were others. They were all the cities of Galilee. They were all the cities of Judea where people equally awaited him. So Jesus worked no other miracle in, Jude in Samaria but the miracle except the mass physical conversion and spiritual conversion shown here. I should say physical conversion. It was a miracle it overcame in one day what forever eludes the world's longest and most strenuous efforts. The marvel of dissolving historic divisions even among God's seeing people. The Jews said they saw God. The Samaritans said they saw God. They worshipped the temples but they didn't see each other. Jesus brought them together. While many religious sects officially indicate that the universal God is the impartial father of all humanity, 
all the divisions, even Christian divisions, constantly separate from each other to dissensions engineered by revered disagreeing leaders. We can't call ourselves leaders if we are dividers. Such separations witness not mutual love and acceptance, but ingrained hostility and scandalous rejection. In the end, conversion is a personal conviction arising out of an independent experience, an independent personal experience of God's love and mercy to the one who seeks. Jesus, yes, was Messiah. He's unlike anyone else, anyone ever sees or ever meets before. A uniquely personal will. And uniquely personal will he ever be. The lesson he gave in Samaria was loud and clear. The Messiah came not only for the Jews, he came also for the apostles. Not only also for the all chosen, the sinners, the Gentiles, he came for all the nations of the world. The door is open. With him, the kingdom of divine revelation is forever expanded to every generation, in every area, to every person. I think now of the word of Saint Sebastian when he converted the niece of the emperor Fabian, Saint Fabiola, and she says, how can God, who is like the, the glory of the heaven, shine on and take care of each individual person? And St. Sebastian says, see that stream there, Fabiola? How many stones does it shine on? Equally. Every one. And shine on the black stones, the white stones, on every one. There's a parable of Jesus on that one too. God lets his light shine on the good and the evil. He lets his rain to fall on the field and on the, on the road, on the gravel on the weeds and the wheat. It's up for us not to take it all in one bundle, but to distinguish and to seek out, to take the wheat and turn it into bread and absorb it and be nourished and take the weeds and take the weeds and separate them from the wheat that strangles. So the Semitic townsmen took pains not to forget the woman at the well who initiated their contact with Jesus. They did not thank her enough. Her original cup of cool water was rewarded beyond comparison. Her joy overflowed. During the two days Jesus walked among the people of Sechem, the, pe the woman assisted him and witnessed one conversion after another. How these people blessed her for giving the, the brave testimony that brought Jesus to their attention. Nor did she make any attempt to stifle their exuberance. With humble pride, she bragged to one and all didn't I tell you so? 
Wasn't I right? He has the words of eternal life. We glory in the people that come to God and we leave them aside. We're not there anymore. They grow and they flourish and they reach out to others. All agreed. They reminded her of another important fact. Yes, we did go to him because of your insistent announcement. It certainly was your admission of guilt and your courageous conversion that simply astounded those of us who knew of your messed up life in our village. No doubt it was our own curiosity regarding that the Christ, what he did for you, he would do for us. But after that, it definitely is what we ourselves see and hear from him and turned out to be true believers. We see for ourselves. And now for Jesus. After this, they wanted him to stay there. But now they could share and help each other. And he had to go. Physically, but I am with you all days, even to the end of time, into the end of your time, to the end of your life, and beyond. Because when you do this, and you evangelize, and you give as well as receive, you become my collaborators. All who you have sent forth, who have died and await you, will embrace you. But the one who really embraces is the Lord who receives you as his collaborator. God bless you and pray for me.